Part One of Space Prison by Tom Godwin, read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Space Prison by Tom Godwin, Part One. For seven weeks the Constellation had been plunging through hyperspace with her eight thousand colonists, fleeing like a hunted thing with her communicators silenced and her drives moaning and thundering. Up in the control room, Irene had been told, the needles of the dials danced against the red danger lines day and night. She lay in bed and listened to the muffled, ceaseless roar of the drives and felt the singing vibration of the hull. We should be almost safe by now, she thought. Athena is only forty days away. Thinking of the new life awaiting them all made her too restless to lie still any longer. She got up to sit on the edge of her bed and switch on the light. Dale was gone. He had been summoned to adjust one of the machines in the ship's X-ray room, and Billy was asleep, nothing showing of him above the covers but a crop of brown hair and the furry nose of his ragged teddy bear. She reached out to straighten the covers gently so as not to awaken him. It happened then, the thing they had all feared. From the stern of the ship came a jarring, deafening explosion. The ship lurched violently, Girder screamed, and the light flicked out. In the darkness she heard a rapid fire thunk, 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 as the automatic guard system slid intercompartment doors shut against sections of the ship suddenly airless. The doors were still thudding shut when another explosion came from toward the bow. Then there was silence a feeling of utter quiet and motionlessness. The fingers of fear enclosed her, and her mind said to her, like the cold, unpassionate voice of a stranger, The Gurns have found us. The light came on again, a feeble glow, and there was the soft, muffled sound of questioning voices in other compartments. She dressed, her fingers shaking and clumsy, wishing the day would come to reassure her to tell her that nothing really serious had happened, that it had not been the Gurns. It was very still in the little compartment, strangely so. She had finished dressing when she realized the reason. The air circulation system had stopped working. That meant the power failure was so great that the air regenerators themselves were dead. And there were eight thousand people on the Constellation who would have to have air to live. The attention buzzer sounded shrilly from the public address system speakers that were scattered down the ship's corridors. A voice she recognized as that of Lieutenant Commander Lake spoke. War was declared upon Earth by the Gurn Empire ten days ago. Two Gurn cruisers have attacked us, and their blasters have destroyed the stern and bow of the ship. We are without a drive and without power, but for a few emergency batteries. I am the Constellation's only surviving officer, and the Gurn commander is boarding us to give me the surrender terms. None of you will leave your compartments until ordered to do so. Wherever you may be, remain there. This is necessary to avoid confusion and to have as many as possible in known locations for future instructions. I repeat you will not leave your compartments." The speaker cut off. She stood without moving and heard again the words, I am the Constellation's only surviving officer. The Gurns had killed her father. He had been second in command of the Dunbar expedition that had discovered the world of Athena, and his knowledge of Athena was valuable to the colonization plans. He had been quartered among the ship's officers, and the Gurn blast had destroyed that section of the ship. She sat down on the edge of the bed again and tried to reorient herself, to accept the fact that her life and the lives of all the others had abruptly, irrevocably been changed. The Athena colonization plan was ended. 
They had known such a thing might happen. That was why the constellation had been made ready for the voyage in secret, and had waited for months for the chance to slip through the ring of Gurn spy ships. That was why she had raced at full speed, with her communicators silenced so there would be no radiations for the Gurns to find her by. Only forty days more would have brought them to the green and virgin world of Athena, four hundred light-years beyond the outermost boundary of the Gurn Empire. There they should have been safe from Gurn detection for many years to come, for long enough to build planetary defenses against attack. And there they would have used Athena's rich resources to make ships and weapons to defend mineral-depleted Earth against the inexorably increasing enclosure of the mighty, coldly calculating colossus that was the Gurn Empire. Success or failure of the Athena plan had meant ultimate life or death for Earth. They had taken every precaution possible, but the Gurn spy system had somehow learned of Athena and the constellation. Now the Cold War was no longer cold, and the plan was dust. Billy sighed and stirred in the little boy's sleep that had not been broken by the blasts that had altered the lives of eight thousand people and the fate of a world. She shook his shoulder and said, Billy. He raised up, so small and young to her eyes, that the question in her mind was like an anguished prayer. Dear God, what do Gurns do to five-year-old boys? He saw her face and the dim light, and the sleepiness was suddenly gone from him. What's wrong, Mama? And why are you scared?" There was no reason to lie to him. The Gurns have found us and stopped us. Oh, he said. In his manner was the grave thoughtfulness of a boy twice his age, as there always was. Will they? Will they kill us? Get dressed, honey, she said. Hurry, so we'll be ready when they let Daddy come back to tell us what to do. They were both ready when the attention buzzer sounded again in the corridors. Blake spoke, his tone grim and bitter. There is no power for the era generators, and within twenty hours we will start smothering to death. Under these circumstances, I could not do other than accept the survival terms the Gurn commander offered us. He will speak to you now, and you will obey his orders without protest. Death is the only alternative. Then the voice of the Gurn commander came, quick and harsh and brittle. This section of space, together with planet Athena, is an extension of the Gurn Empire. This ship has deliberately invaded Gurn territory in time of war, with intent to seize and exploit a Gurn world. We are willing, however, to offer a leniency not required by the circumstances. Terran technicians and skilled workers in certain fields can be used in the factories we shall build on Athena. The others will not be needed, and there is not room on the cruisers to take them. Your occupation records will be used to divide you into two groups, the Acceptables and the Rejects. The rejects will be taken by the cruisers to an Earth-type planet near here and left, together with personal possessions in their compartments and additional and ample supplies. The acceptables will then be taken on to Athena, and at a later date the cruisers will return the rejects to Earth. This division will split families, but there will be no resistance to it. Gurn guards will be sent immediately to make this division and you will wait in your compartments for them. You will obey their orders promptly and without annoying them with questions. At the first instance of resistance or rebellion, this offer will be withdrawn and the cruisers will go their way again." In the silence following the ultimatum she could hear the soft, wordless murmur from the other compartments, the undertone of anxiety like a dark thread through it. In every compartment parents and children, brothers and sisters, were seeing one another for the last time. The corridor outside rang to the tramp of feet, the sound of a dozen gurns walking with swift military precision. 
She held her breath, her heart racing, but they went past her door and on to the corridor's end. There she could faintly hear them entering compartments, demanding names, and saying, Out! Out! Once she heard a Gurn say, Acceptables will remain inside until further notice. Do not open your doors after the rejects have been taken out. Billy touched her on the hand. Isn't Daddy going to come? He, he can't right now. We'll see him pretty soon. She remembered what the Gurn commander had said about the rejects being permitted to take their personal possessions. She had very little time in which to get together what she could carry. There were two small bags in the compartment, and she hurried to pack them, with things she and Dale and Billy might need, not able to know which of them, if any, would be rejects. Nor could she know whether she should put in clothes for a cold world or a hot one. The Gurn commander had said the rejects would be left on an Earth-type planet, but where could it be? The Dunbar expedition had explored across five hundred light-years of space and had found only one Earth-type world, Athena. The Gurns were almost to her door when she had finished, and she heard them enter the compartments across from her own. There came the hard, curt questions and the command, Outside! Hurry! A woman said something in pleading question, and there was the soft thud of a blow, and the words, Outside! Do not ask questions! A moment later, she heard the woman going down the corridor, trying to hold back her crying. Then the Gurns were at her own door. She held Billy's hand and waited for them with her heart hammering. She held her head high and composed herself with all the determination she could muster, so that the arrogant Gurns would not see that she was afraid. Billy stood beside her, as tall as his five years would permit, his teddy bear under his arm, and only the way his hand held to hers showed that he too was scared. The door was flung open, and two Gurns strode in. They were big, dark men, with powerful, bulging muscles. They surveyed her and the room with a quick sweep of eyes that were like glittering obsidian, their mouths thin, cruel slashes in the flat, brutal planes of their faces. "'Your name?' snapped the one who carried a sheaf of occupation records. "'It's—' She tried to swallow the quaver in her voice and make it cool and unfrightened. Irene Lois Humboldt, Mrs. Dale Humboldt. The Gurn glanced at the papers. Where is your husband? He was in the X-ray room at— You are a reject. Out! Down the corridor with the others. My husband, he will— he will— Outside! It was the tone of voice that had preceded the blow in the other compartment, and the Gurn took a quick step toward her. She seized the two bags in one hand, not wanting to release Billy, and swung back to hurry out into the corridor. The other Gurn jerked one of the bags from her hand and flung it to the floor. "'Only one bag per person,' he said, and gave her an impatient shove that sent her and Billy stumbling through the doorway. She became part of the rejects who were being herded like sheep down the corridors and into the port airlock. There were many children among them, the young ones frightened and crying, and often with only one parent or an older brother or sister to take care of them. And there were many young ones who had no one at all, and were dependent upon strangers to take their hands and tell them what they must do. When she was passing the corridor that led to the X-ray room, she saw a group of rejects being heard up it. Dale was not among them, and she knew then that she and Billy would never see him again. Out from the ship! Faster! Faster! The commands of the Gurn guards snapped like whips around them as she and the other rejects crowded and stumbled down the boarding ramp and out onto the rocky ground. There was the pull of a terrible gravity, such as she had never experienced, and they were in a bleak, barren valley, a cold wind moaning down it and whipping the alkali dust in bitter clouds. Around the valley stood ragged hills, their white tops laying out streamers of wind-driven snow, and the sky was dark with sunset. 
Out from the ship! Faster! It was hard to walk fast in the high gravity, carrying the bag in one hand and holding up all of Billy's weight she could with the other. They lied to us, a man beside her said to someone. Let's turn and fight. Let's take— A gurn blaster cracked with a vivid blue flash, and the man plunged lifelessly to the ground. She flinched instinctively and fell over an unseen rock, the bag of precious clothes flying from her hand. She scrambled up again, her left knee half numb, and turned to retrieve it. The Gurn guard was already upon her, his blaster still in his hand. Out from the ship! Faster! The barrel of his blaster lashed across the side of her head. Move on! Move on! She staggered in a blinding blaze of pain and then hurried on, holding tight to Billy's hand the wind cutting like knives of ice through her thin clothes, and blood running in a trickle down her cheek. "'He hit you,' Billy said. "'He hurt you.' Then he called the Gurn a name that five-year-old boys were not supposed to know, with a savagery that five-year-old boys were not supposed to possess. When she stopped at the outer fringe of rejects, she saw that all of them were out of the cruiser, and the guards were going back into it. A half mile down the valley, the other cruiser stood, the rejects out from it and its boarding ramps already withdrawn. When she had buttoned Billy's blouse tighter and wiped the blood from her face, the first blast of the drives came from the farther cruiser. The nearer one blasted a moment later, and they lifted together, their roaring filling the valley. They climbed faster and faster, dwindling as they went. Then they disappeared in the black sky, their roaring faded away, and there was left only the moaning of the wind around her, and somewhere a child crying. And somewhere a voice asking, "'Where are we? In the name of God, what have they done to us?' She looked at the snow streaming from the ragged hills, felt the hard pull of the gravity, and knew where they were. They were on Ragnarok, the hell world of 1.5 gravity, and fierce beasts and raging fevers where men could not survive. The name came from an old Teutonic myth and meant the last day for gods and men. The Dunbar expedition had discovered Ragnarok, and her father had told her of it, of how it had killed six of the eight men who had left the ship and would have killed all of them if they had remained any longer. She knew where they were, and she knew the Gurns had lied to them and would never send a ship to take them to Earth. Their abandonment here had been intended as a death sentence for all of them. And Dale was gone, and she and Billy would die helpless and alone. "'It will be dark so soon,' Billy's voice shook with the cold. If Daddy can't find us in the dark, what will we do? I don't know, she said. There's no one to help us, and how can I know what we should do? She was from the city. How could she know what to do on an alien, hostile world where armed explorers had died? She had tried to be brave before the Gurns, but now, now night was at hand, and out of it would come terror and death for herself and Billy. They would never see Dale again, never see Athena or Earth or even the dawn on the world that had killed them. She tried not to cry and failed. Billy's cold little hand touched her own, trying to reassure her. Don't cry, Mama. I guess, I guess everybody else is scared too. Every one else. She was not alone. How could she have thought she was all alone? All around her were others, as helpless and uncertain as she. Her story was only one out of four thousand. I guess they are, Billy, she said. I never thought of that before. She knelt to put her arms around him, thinking, Tears and fear are futile weapons. They can never bring us any tomorrows. 
we'll have to fight whatever comes to kill us, no matter how scared we are. For ourselves and for our children. Above all else, for our children. I'm going back to find our clothes, she said. You wait here for me, in the shelter of that rock, and I won't be gone long. Then she told him what he would be too young to really understand. I'm not going to cry any more, and I know now what I must do. I'm going to make sure that there is a tomorrow for you, always, to the last breath of my life. The bright blue star dimmed and the others faded away. Dawn touched the sky, bringing with it a coldness that frosted the steel of the rifle in John Prentice's hands and formed beads of ice on his gray mustache. There was a stirring in the area behind him as the weary rejects prepared to face the new day and the sound of a child whimpering from the cold. There had been no time the evening before to gather wood for fires. Prowlers! The warning cry came from an outer guard, and black shadows were suddenly sweeping out of the dark dawn. They were things that might have been half wolf, half tiger, each of them three hundred pounds of incredible ferocity, with eyes blazing like yellow fire in their white fanged tiger wolf faces. They came like the wind, in a flowing black wave, and ripped through the outer guard line as though it had not existed. The inner guards fired in a chattering roll of gunshots, trying to turn them, and Prentice's rifle licked out pale tongues of flame as he added his own fire. The prowlers came on, breaking through, but part of them went down and the others were swerved by the fire so that they struck only the outer edge of the area where the rejects were grouped. At that distance they blended into the dark ground so that he could not find them in the sights of his rifle. He could only watch helplessly and see a dark-haired woman caught in their path, trying to run with a child in her arms and already knowing it was too late. A man was running toward her, slow in the high gravity, an axe in his hands and his cursing a raging, savage snarl. For a moment her white face was turned in helpless appeal to him and the others. Then the prowlers were upon her, and she fell, deliberately, going to the ground with her child hugged in her arms beneath her, so that her body would protect it. The prowlers passed over her, pausing for an instant to slash the life from her, and raced on again. They vanished back into the outer darkness, the farther guards firing futilely, and there was a silence but for the distant, hysterical sobbing of a woman. It had happened within seconds. The fifth prowler attacked that night, and the mildest. Full dawn had come by the time he replaced the guards killed by the last attack and made the rounds of the other guard lines. He came back by the place where the prowlers had killed the woman, walking wearily against the pull of gravity. She lay with her dark hair tumbled and stained with blood, her white face turned up to the reddening sky, and he saw her clearly for the first time. It was Irene. He stopped, gripping the cold steel of the rifle and not feeling the rear sight as it cut into his hand. Irene! He had not known she was on Ragnarok. He had not seen her in the darkness of the night, and he had hoped she and Billy were safe among the acceptables with Dale. There was the sound of footsteps, and a bold-faced girl in a red skirt stopped beside him, her glance going over him curiously. "'The little boy,' he asked, "'do you know if he's all right?' "'The prowlers cut up his face, but he'll be all right,' she said. "'I came back after his clothes.' Are you going to look after him? Someone has to, and, she shrugged her shoulders, I guess I was soft enough to elect myself for the job. Why, was his mother a friend of yours? She was my daughter, he said. Oh. For a moment the bold, brassy look was gone from her face, like a mask that had slipped. I'm sorry, and I'll take care of Billy. The first objection to his assumption of leadership occurred an hour later. The prowlers had withdrawn with the coming of full daylight, 
and wood had been carried from the trees to build fires. Mary, one of the volunteer cooks, was asking two men to carry her some water when he approached. The smaller man picked up one of the clumsy containers, hastily improvised from canvas, and started toward the creek. The other, a big, thick-chested man, did not move. "'We'll have to have water,' Mary said. "'People are hungry and cold and sick.' The man continued to squat by the fire, his hands extended to its warmth. "'Name someone else,' he said. "'But—' She looked at Prentice in uncertainty. He went to the thick-chested man, knowing there would be violence, and welcoming it as something to help drive away the vision of Irene's pale, cold face under the red sky. "'She asked you to get her some water,' he said. "'Get it.' The man looked up at him, studying him with deliberate insolence. Then he got to his feet, his heavy shoulders hunched challengingly. "'I'll have to set you straight, old-timer,' he said. "'No one has appointed you head cheese around here. Now, there's the container you want filled, and over there,' he made a small motion with one hand, "'is the creek. Do you know what to do?' Yes, he said, I know what to do. He brought the butt of the rifle smashing up. It struck the man under the chin, and there was a sharp cracking sound as his jawbone snapped. For a fraction of a second there was an expression of stupefied amazement on his face, then his eyes glazed, and he slumped to the ground with his broken jaw setting askew. All right, he said to Mary, now you go ahead and name somebody else. He found that the prowlers had killed seventy during the night. One hundred more had died from the hell fever that often followed exposure and killed within an hour. He went the half-mile to the group that arrived on the second cruiser as soon as he had eaten a delayed breakfast. He saw, before he had quite reached the other group, that the Constellation's lieutenant commander, Vincent Lake, was in charge of it. Lake, a tall, hard-jawed man, with pale eyes under pale brows, walked forth to meet him as soon as he recognized him. "'Glad to see you're still alive,' Lake greeted him. "'I thought that second gurn blast got you along with the others.' "'I was visiting midship and wasn't home when it happened,' he said. He looked at Lake's group of rejects, in their misery and uncertainty so much like his own, and asked, "'How was it last night?' Bad, damned bad, Lake said. Prowlers and hell fever, and no wood for fires. Two hundred died last night. I came down to see if anyone was in charge here, and to tell them that we'll have to move into the woods at once, today. We'll have plenty of wood for the fires there, some protection from the wind, and by combining our defenses we can stand off the prowlers better. Lake agreed. When the brief discussion of plans was finished, he asked, "'How much do you know about Ragnarok?' "'Not much,' Prentice answered. "'We didn't stay to study it very long. There are no heavy metals on Ragnarok's other sun. It's position in the advance of the resources of any value. We gave Ragnarok a quick survey, and when the sixth man died, we marked it on the chart as uninhabitable and went on our way.' As you probably know, that bright blue star is Ragnarok's other sun. Its position in the advance of the yellow sun shows the season to be early spring. When summer comes, Ragnarok will swing between the two suns, and the heat will be something no human has ever endured. Nor the cold when winter comes. I know of no edible plants, although there might be some. There are a few species of rodent-like animals, they're scavengers, and a herbivore we call a woods goat. The prowlers are the dominant form of life on Ragnarok, and I suspect their intelligence is a good deal higher than we would like it to be. There will be a constant battle for survival with them. There's another animal, not as intelligent as the prowlers, but just as dangerous, the unicorn. The unicorns are big and fast, and they travel in herds. 
I haven't seen any here so far. I hope we don't. At the lower elevations are the swamp crawlers. They're unadulterated nightmares. I hope they don't go to these higher elevations in the summer. The prowlers and the hell fever, the gravity and heat and cold and starvation, will be enough for us to have to fight. I see, Lake said. He smiled, a smile that was as bleak as moonlight on an arctic glacier. Earth type, remember the promise the Gurns made the rejects? He looked out across the camp, at the snow whipping from the frosty hills, at the dead and the dying, and a little girl trying vainly to awaken her brother. They were condemned without reason, without a chance to live, he said. So many of them are so young, and when you're young it's too soon to have to die. End of Part One